Hi. Uh, so I'm sort of your conscience. Um, I'm a big fan of, of big data, and I'm a big fan of analyzing data. But I worry that sometimes um, error can slip into the analyses that we do. And we can get very overexcited about the kind of data that we have and fail to recognize that there are simple things that we can do to try and eradicate that error from data. Now, the most straightforward way to ensure that the, the most straightforward ways to ensure that your data is free from error are tricky, and they go outside just analyzing uh, the contents of a spreadsheet or a database that's in front of you. The most important, I think, is something called randomization. Because we know that correlation doesn't equal causation. So we know, for example, that if you give somebody a homeopathic sugar pill that contains no medicine, they're probably going to get better anyway. Now, they're going to get better partly because of the placebo effect, partly because when you take a sugar pill, because of your beliefs and expectations, you're quite likely to get better. And we know that from a whole raft of experiments comparing actually one kind of placebo against another in a randomized trial. So we know that three sugar pills a day are more effective than two sugar pills a day at eradicating gastric ulcers, which is an outrageous finding, but it's, it's true. We know from three different studies on three different types of pain that a salt water injection is a more effective treatment for pain than taking a dummy sugar pill. And that's not because a dummy sugar pill does anything physically to your body and nor does a salt water injection. It's because an injection feels like a much more dramatic intervention. So if you just looked at the data of people who get given homeopathic sugar pills and then get better, you would be misled. And that's why people invented randomized trials. And the first randomized trial is in the Bible. It's a very old idea. It's in Daniel 1.15. Uh, he comes along and, and he's, uh, he's met at the gates of um, the, the kingdom of King Nebuchadnezzar. And, uh, and the eunuch says, oh, you're welcome in and you have to join our army and we're going to give you the king's meat because you have to eat the king's meat to be big and strong. And Daniel says, well, we don't want the king's meat. We only eat vegetables. And the eunuch says, if you have to eat the king's meat. If you don't eat the king's meat, uh, they'll do to me whatever it is that you do to a eunuch to make their life even worse. And Daniel says, well, how about this? We cast lots, and some of us will have the king's meat, and some of us won't. And then uh, we'll wait and see if, any, if either group is stronger at the end, and then we'll know whether or not the king's meat actually makes a difference to our fighting power. And they did that, and it turned out that the people who didn't have the king's meat were no weaker than the people who did, and that was fully published in the Bible, which is a very high-impact journal. Um, <laughs> So randomization is not a new and difficult idea. But the problem with randomization is it requires that you have access to the situation before the data is collected. You have to randomly assign one group or another to receive different interventions. Now, this is done very commonly, for example, in web design. And in web design, it's an interesting example, I think, of convergent evolution. Because lots of people who work in web design do A-B tests, but don't regard them as being anything to do with randomized control trials in medicine. So to give you an example, um, you'll have seen on the Wikipedia page for a long time, uh, there was a picture of Jimmy Wales at the top saying, please click here and give us all your money. Now, that wasn't because Jimmy Wales is uh, an arrogant and narcissistic human being. I mean, I have no idea if he is. Um, it was because they'd done a randomized trial to see which kind of banner was most effective at getting clicks and most effective at getting donations. So they had randomly assigned visitors to Wikipedia to go to either a page that had a banner with you know, a starving child in Africa, she could have free unfettered access to knowledge, or a hot young intern in San Francisco, um, or Jimmy Wales. And Jimmy Wales was the, was the entry that got the most clicks and the most donations. So that's the one that they went with. Now, more recently, I've been involved in trying to get trials going in government. Now, getting randomized trials going in government is an interesting challenge. Because firstly, you have enormous rich sources of data, routinely collected and administrative data that can be exploited very readily and very powerfully to get important answers about which interventions in government work best to achieve their stated goals. But it's also a really interesting area to try and do trials, because there are lots and lots of people who don't want their ideas to be tested. And this happens as all, uh, you know, everywhere in the world. It happens in, in business as well. It also happened in medicine, actually. It's, it's interesting to note that, that people think of, of, of randomized trials as being this kind of force of nature in medicine. But actually, it was only 30 or 40 years ago that Archie Cochrane, the great grandfather of evidence based medicine, was having huge stand up rows with senior doctors, especially surgeons, as recently as the 80s. 
he'd sit them down and he'd say, well, look, you know, for this tumour, for this level of spread, what's the right treatment? And one surgeon would say, oh, you just remove the lump. And you go, well, how do you know that's the answer? And you say, well, I'm the professor of breast cancer surgery at St. Catherine's. I'm a world expert. How else do you think I know? And he goes to another surgeon and he say, well, this exact same tumour, this exact same level of spread, exact same cytology, what's the right treatment? And they say, well, I, I do a radical mastectomy. I'd, I'd remove both breasts. I'd remove all of the muscle tissue on the front of the ribcage and I'd clear the armpits. This huge disfiguring operation, but it may be justifiable if it improves long-term survival and people give consent knowing that fact. And Cochrane said, well, how do you know that that's the best treatment? He said, well, I'm the world-famous breast cancer surgeon at, at St. Mungo's. Of course I know best. So he ended up having to get lots of these people all together in one room. He said it was a bit like having lots of people on a psychiatric ward who all think that they're Napoleon. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I think it's really... Um, I think it's really disturbing to note how recently that was. Similarly in the 70s, actually, I mean, he had to play jokes on people to get them to accept that sometimes, even with the best of intentions, our, our, our interventions can do harm. He did one study on coronary care units, and at the time we didn't have any good treatments for, for people who just had a heart attack. And so um, he said, well, I don't know if specialist treatment in a coronary care unit is worse than just going home and being looked after by your GP. It certainly is now, but we didn't know if it was back then when we didn't have good treatments. So he said, okay, let's do a randomised trial. All the people from cardiology department said, well, this is mad, you're insane, you're a murderer if you do this. You're depriving people of these effective interventions. So they ran the trial, and halfway through, he had some interim results, and he called in some cardiologists, and he put out the results, and he says, well, gentlemen, I'm very... Because they were gentlemen, unfortunately. I, I'm very sorry to have to tell you that it looks like you were right. We've just done the interim results, and it looks like the people who were sent home to GP care, it looks like they're dying faster, and the people who are staying in with you have got better survival, and I'm very sorry about that. And the room erupted in outrage, and they said, well, you're a murderous bastard. We told you this, Archie Cochrane. What are you going to do now? This is a GMC matter. And he said, well, I'm sorry to tell you, gentlemen, but actually I've played a practical joke on you. Pulled down the, the, the whiteboard and had the real results in which it turned out that the coronary care units were killing people. And then said, ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so randomised trials are really important. And they can stop you doing harm where you think you're doing good, and people can be very resistant to doing them. So, in government, let me tell you about one trial that's been done just recently, and if you're interested at all in any of this, um, there's this paper that I helped write with some very smart civil servants called Test, Learn, Adapt, which is about using randomised trials in policy. And um, the most elegant trial of the lot, and there are about ten described in there, exploits routinely collected administrative data and very, very cheap intervention. So what it does is it compares the impact of some slightly different reminder letters to get you to pay your tax bill on time, to get you to send in your tax form on time, and then looks to see the impact on the arrival of your form. Now, for the follow-up data, the outcome data, this is just from routinely collected data. This comes from HMRC. HMRC has a, a field in their table that says when your form arrives. The intervention, where well, there's no difference in the cost of ink on paper that goes out, and it's different kind of tricks and quirks in the reminder letter. You know, do you guilt trip people by saying this is what other people in your postcode area have done or do you just sort of send them a normal, formal, boring letter? And it turns out that one kind of reminder letter, and I don't care which one because I'm not interested in answers, I'm interested in methods, but one kind of reminder letter has a huge impact on getting people to send their forms in on time, which means that there are huge savings for government because they've got an even workload over the course of the year. Now, when I say a huge impact, it doesn't have to have a huge impact on the number of people sending in their forms to have a huge impact relative to the cost of doing the trial. Because the value of information here is such that to, if to do a trial is a matter of 10, 50, 100,000 pounds, then if you can sow a cost saving of even a million, two million, 10 million, 20 million. <coughs> that represents an, enormous, an enormously valuable piece of information. The cost of getting that information relative to the savings that can come from it. But it's important to recognise also, I think, that this kind of data will often give you disappointing answers. It'll often say that an intervention doesn't work. You'll often find that things that do work only have very modest benefits. And that, I think, is not a reason to never bother doing trials. 
It's a reason to embed trials as seamlessly and routinely as possible so that you can be in a constant cycle of testing and learning. How long have I been? Does anybody know how long I've been talking for? <laughs> they said there was a clock. Oh, there it is. I've got seven minutes and 43 seconds left. Let me tell you about another really heinous source of, of uh, error in data, which I think is really vicious and, uh, and harms patients on a global scale, and uh, which I've just put a book out on, but ignore that, just focus on the horror. Um, okay, so missing trials. Um, it turns out that uh, when you do a randomized trial in medicine, um, you don't have to publish it. You can get away with not publishing it. So you can do a whole bunch of trials, and if three of them have a positive answer and say that your drug is great, you publish those, you give those to doctors and patients. They use that information to make what they believe is an informed choice about whether a treatment works or not. And then uh, the remaining 10 trials, which show that your treatment is no good, are buried. They're hidden from them. They never, ever see them. Now, this is really important because... Uh, in medicine, we don't rely on cherry-picking data. We synthesize all of the evidence together, okay? So this is a, a forest plot or a blobogram. This is the Cochrane Collaboration's logo. Cochrane Collaboration is an international non-profit body who uh, bring together all of the evidence on any given subject in medicine. Oh, God, there are loads of you now. The lights are down. Um, bring together all of the evidence on any question in medicine. So this is uh, a bunch of trials all being summarized on the question of whether having a steroid injection improves survival for preterm babies. Okay, so you give the steroid injection to the mother just before they deliver. Does it uh, increase their survival? Now, each of these horizontal lines is a trial. If it's a very narrow line, that means that it's a very big trial. It's got very little sampling error, so it's got a very narrow confidence interval. If it's a very wide trial, if it's a very wide line, that means it's a small trial with lots and lots of error in it. And this line here, the vertical line in the middle, that's the line of no effect. And if your trial touches that, then that means that it showed no benefit. If it's over to the left, it means it did show a benefit. And if it's over to the right, it means it actively hurt you. So you can see by looking at this that at the top, there's one large, very accurate trial that shows a benefit. Then below that, there's a small one with very wide confidence intervals that shows no benefit. There's a few more of those. Then there's a big inaccurate one that shows a benefit. Then there's a, a very large um, accurate trial that shows no benefit. So you can see that for a long time, doctors were divided about whether it was worth giving this treatment or not. And that wasn't because we didn't have enough evidence to make the decision. What happened was this. Some doctors would say, oh, well, we know that these injections are a really good idea because, look, we've got all of these trials. Look, there's that really big accurate one and there's this other one and this one's pretty equivocal and putting those together we reckon that probably giving steroid injections saves lives but then some other doctors would say well we're not going to give this because it might have side effects and look there's a big accurate trial that says it's got no benefit and there are lots more showing it's got no benefit in fact overall there are more negative trials than there are positive trials altogether so for years and years there was disagreement about which was the right treatment to give and for years and years people were deprived of these steroid injections. But the problem is they were effective. So this diamond at the bottom of the Cochrane logo, you can see, that's the summary effect size. That's what happens if you pull all of the data together. You synthesize it in one place, and you get one very accurate summary, and that shows you that steroid injections are effective. They do save lives of preterm babies when given to the mother just before she gives birth. What that means is... People were deprived of an effective treatment, not because we didn't have the information, but because it wasn't effectively synthesized together in one place. So it's important to recognize that in medicine, we need to synthesize together all of the evidence rather than cherry picking. Because if we cherry pick, we make the wrong decision and we harm people. So I was saying that data goes missing. So what's the evidence? Well. Um, you can demonstrate that data's gone missing in two ways. You can do it either with statistics or with stories. But you're dorks, I'm assuming. You are dorks, aren't you? I haven't come to the wrong building by mistake. So this is, uh, this is one way of showing the presence or, of something called publication bias. This is one way of showing that um, negative trials, trials with unflattering results, have gone missing in action. Okay? So this is a funnel plot. And what you do is, from bottom to top, okay, the, the, more, the more accurate, the larger trials are at the top, so they're prone to less error, because bigger trials, more accurate estimate of the benefits. Now, each of these points is a trial, 
And from left to right along the bottom, what you can see is whether the trial gave a positive or negative result. So the trials over here showed uh, that the intervention was really great. The trials over here showed that the intervention was really terrible. Now, what you would expect to see if there's no publication bias, if there are no negative trials going missing in action, is you'd expect to see all of the big trials cluster around the two, what, true answer up at the top. And then as you come down to the bottom, to the smaller, less accurate trials, you'd expect to see some excessively positive trials over here and some excessively negative trials over here. If there's publication bias, then it's easier for small negative randomised trials to disappear than for big randomised trials to disappear. Because if you think about it, brushing um, a sort of a 12 centre international randomised trial under the carpet is quite a tricky business. Whereas if it's just in one hospital, then it's very easy for those results to go missing in action. So, what you'd expect to see if there was publication bias in a field is these small studies selectively go missing in action. So, that's what you can kind of see here, although the, the evidence for presence of publication bias on this funnel plot um, is inconclusive, it's not statistically significant. But here you can see. Down at the bottom left, where you'd expect to see lots of smaller negative studies, there are none. They seem to have gone missing. And this is a funnel plot examining for the presence of publication bias in studies of publication bias, which I think is the funniest <laughs> epidemiology joke we'll ever hear. So, uh, but you can also show it with stories. This is a drug called Tamiflu. Uh, Tamiflu is a drug which governments around the world have spent billions and billions and billions of pounds on. Uh, and they've done that not in the belief that it's going to reduce the duration of your flu symptoms, although I'm very sorry for you if you have the flu, it's horrible. We pay for Tamiflu because we think it will reduce the number of complications. Complications is a medical uh, euphemism for, for pneumonia and death. <clears throat> and yet Roche are still to this day withholding from Cochrane much of the information that they need to make an informed judgment about whether or not this does actually achieve that goal, which is a remarkable and extraordinary thing. This is a drug called Reboxetine. I only mention it because it's one of the most extreme examples. Uh, it's a drug that I've prescribed. It's an antidepressant. I read two or three trials which showed that it was effective. In actual fact, there's about four times as much data that was collected showing that it was completely ineffective, worse than any other antidepressant. And God knows antidepressants aren't very effective anyway in mild and moderate depression but also no better than placebo. So that's an astonishing thing to me because I was personally misled into prescribing a treatment which is not effective. That's my view. Uh, but you can also see it's a, a, a huge problem that cuts across the board. This is a clicker that isn't actually connected to a machine, so I think going through a thousand things is going to work very badly. Anyway, uh, you can see that basically it started off with pretty much a 50-50 split. There were about 36 trials with negative results in the ones that were presented to the FDA, which could be obtained with a lot of digging and effort and harassment. Um, and of course, remember that that's not all the trials that are ever conducted on a treatment, not all the trials that are conducted necessarily get given to regulators. Um, but then when they went and looked for what was actually published, what they found was that only... Um, only one of the negative results was published, and only uh, whereas all of the trials with positive results were published. So that's you know huge and elaborate and ridiculous because you can see there's this huge disparity. People have tried thousands and thousands of things to try and fix this, but none of it's made any difference. Uh, and I've done something which, uh, with these very lovely people who I, I can't go back to show you their names because of this strange machine. Uh, ah, magic. Um, <clears throat> with these very lovely people, uh, and what we've done is we've built this machine that goes and grabs all of the trials registers um, for any evidence of trials that have been conducted and completed, and then we try and match them against trials which have been published, and the nice thing about that is uh, we can show you individual studies that are either missing or present, but more than that, we can also give you ranked lists of worst offenders, the worst drugs, the worst companies, the worst researchers, the worst research sites. We can do a bit of quantitative analysis, so we can show you that whether industry or non-industry funded studies come out faster. We can uh, give individual doctors and patients information, how much data is missing from my drug and who has it with the administrative contact field. Uh, we can tell them who to get in touch with uh, and give them their email address of the person who's withholding that data. Um, now, we need uh, help, although I think coding help is sort of by the by. What we really need is money to pay for people to do the very boring job of looking for the trials. Um, but also, uh, I think there's a real role for things like patient organisations to get involved here, because I think, for example, the Diabetes Society should be standing up and saying, we're the Diabetes Society, our members have diabetes, we're going to sit on the trials registers, and if there's any trial that has been conducted and completed more than one year ago that hasn't yet been published, we're going to get in touch with the company that ran it and say, where's that data? We have diabetes, our members need that information to make informed decisions. Thank you very much.